All right. Well, good morning, everybody, again. Again, welcome to One Love Church. So glad you guys decided to be with us this morning. I got a few announcements for us, and then we'll get into our worship service together. Uh, first thing I have is, hey, yesterday we had our lake day. We took the student ministry out to the lake. Thank you, everybody who prayed for us and support us. We had a great time, a great time of fellowship, food, and it was just some great friendship building, I believe. It was a really, really great time. So thank you guys for your support in all of that. And I really appreciate those who gave to make it possible. Uh, the next thing I have is, if you guys remember two weeks ago, we had a wonderful uh, guest speaker. She spoke right at the beginning of the service, Miss Lori. She's a missionary overseas, and uh, she shared a little bit about her mission uh, prop projects, the different things she's involved with, spreading the gospel around the world. And she just uh, politely asked, very, very calmly to, to give if we could as a church family. I tell you guys what, One Love Church went over and out and gave to her ministry. I believe that we raised over $12,000 for Miss Lori. Yeah, that's wonderful. Praise God for that. If you guys remember, she specifically asked for prayer over their, their flooring, concrete flooring for the new church building, uh, because what they had before, this, they, they were worshiping in sand, and the sand gnats were so bad, it was, but they were biting the kids and affecting the service, and they pretty much just couldn't meet. But because of One Love Church and other donors around the world, they are pouring their new concrete floor as we speak. So praise God for that, right? It's fantastic. Uh, the next announcement I have is October 29th. That is One Love Church Fall Festival. Really looking forward to that. It's going to have just a great, a lot of awesome opportunities for us to, to fellowship, a lot of great activities ready. Uh, it's not going to be just for kids. It's going to be for all ages. So look forward to that. Pray for us with that. With those uh, things in mind, we do need folks to step up to help provide baked goods. Uh, we want to do a trunk or treat, right? So prepare your cars to decorate and do candy. And of course, we need folks to help set up, prepare, and then take down and clean up as well. So pray about that. If you're willing to help, uh, you can see me afterwards and I can get you connected with the folks over that. So I think that's all I have. My brother Mike's going to come pray for us this morning. And as he's on his way up, I just want to remind you guys about our regular tithes and offerings here at the church. We have those black boxes right by the back doors. And you can give online. And of course, you can give in our online kiosk in the lobby. So thank you guys so much. Here's brother Mike. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to praise and worship you, to learn from your word. Dear Father, I lift this service up to you and I ask that you give us open hearts. Dear Father, open our eyes to your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. I ask that you bless us and that we would learn to be available to you. We love you so much and we praise you and we thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. You might. Hey, let's praise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning.
should be thankful for this morning. I'm so thankful that we got to take um, the student ministry out yesterday. We had a great time. We learned a lot of things about each other. And um, I learned that I do not bounce back as fast after being pulled on a tube down the lake. So, but we had a great time and it's just an awesome morning to worship. And, and it's great that we can worship here on Sundays, but worship doesn't just stay here on Sundays. That goes through the week and it even happened yesterday as we we're on the lake having fun. We're worshiping, we're fellowshipping in the beauty of God's creation. And he's created so many beautiful things. And you know, his most prized creation is us. Isn't that crazy? He is so worthy to be praised this morning. If you all will worship with us, this next song is called Holy is the Lord, and that is exactly what he is. Let all that I am praise the Lord. 
with my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he's done for me. Thank you. 
we thank you for today. We thank you for your holiness, God, and for looking at us when we were unholy and we were unrighteous, and you scooped us up and you cleansed us, God. And there's no blemish on us. We thank you for the promise of heaven. We thank you for the salvation that you so freely give, that you became unholy, so you took on all of our sins so that, that we could be holy in you, God, and that we could be free of all of our blemishes. I just ask that you be with us this service, God, and that we take in the things that Landon's gonna bring to us this morning. We ask that you bless him and open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear what you want us to hear this morning so that we can go out and be a light to our community, to our families, to our friends this week, God. And we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your holiness, God. And it's in your name I pray, amen. Hey man, let's give these guys a big hand today. It was great, fantastic. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn over to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, we're going to be in chapter number five. And um, we've been talking the last three weeks about being available. And that means giving God everything, right? Talent, time, treasure, you name it, right? God uh, needs it. He, he, he wants to use it. And uh, he's just looking for somebody who's willing to come along and say, Lord, here I am, use me. And uh, this morning we're going to see uh, once again uh, some uh, friends who made themselves available. And uh, uh, today if we were to have a, a title, I would say this, there's always a way. There's always a a way. And so um, we're going to jump right into it. Luke chapter number five. We're going to begin in verse number 17. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on screen. We'll have the scripture uh, there for you. In the gospel of Luke in chapter number five, beginning verse 17, the Bible says this. On one of those days, as he was teaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Um, let, let's stop right there for a moment. The interesting thing is you read through uh, Luke's gospel, especially in Luke chapter 5, a couple of things you find. Luke mentions uh, one occasion, and he tells a story about what Jesus did. Then he comes down and he mentions one city in particular, and he talks about what Jesus did there. And now he comes uh, another time here, and he says, in one of those days. Now he's talking about a particular day. And uh, this day was like most in Jesus' ministry, right? Uh, a time when uh, Jesus would teach a time when uh, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and he had the ability to heal. And uh, when people would hear about this, when people would hear about Jesus coming, crowds would come, multitudes would gather. And, and this day was no different, right? And, and so we find here that multitudes of people, they're coming in to hear him teach. They want to see him heal. Jesus had returned to Capernaum. He had been gone for about a year now. And so now he's come back and people are just excited to see him and uh, really uh, getting close to the height of his ministry. And uh, many people believe that he, he, it tells us he visits a house. Many people believe that that is Peter's house uh, that he is at. Um, but as news quickly spread, people began coming. They wanted to hear, and the crowds are gathering around this home. And uh, it's interesting because Luke provides some details. Peter remembered, right? And that's why many people think, hey, mate, this is Peter's uh, house. He was like, hey, there's people there. They're from every village. They came from Galilee, from Judea. They even came from the capital city in Jerusalem. And, and so there's very details here. And he said the Pharisees were there. Who were these people? These were like the political elite, the religious authority of the day. Jesus had healed a leper, something that had not been done since the prophets were there. It just doesn't happen. You get leprosy, man, that is tough sledding, right? Nothing can be done for you. 
until you come across Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus heals a leper and he goes to the temple and he presents himself before the priest as the, the Old Testament instructed him to do so. And everybody, they cannot believe what they are seeing. And the man tells them, hey, Jesus healed me. And so these same Pharisees, right, who can't believe this man that everybody knew had leprosy has now been healed, something that has not been done in hundreds, if not thousands of years. They want to go see the man who did this, right? And so they have come and gathered because they want to be around Jesus. They want to hear what he has to say. They want to observe him. And so literally, guys, the house is full. It is packed. Uh, the fire code has been shattered, okay? Uh, everybody's around. It is five to six people deep everywhere. And uh, many want to get in, but they can't. And the Bible tells us, uh, Luke says, that the power of God was on Jesus uh, to heal. And what's amazing is this, that, you know, the other guys, they had a theology of healing. Jesus had people that he healed. And here we find him doing that. God touching people's lives. Jesus had a different authority, a different power. It is divine origins, right? And here's the great news. Uh, does Jesus still heal people today? What do you think? Absolutely, right? Uh, he had this power that God had given him while he was on earth. Well, here's one of the last things that he said to the disciples before he sinned that it's in Matthew chapter 28, right? We all get the great commission that Jesus gave to go out in all the world. But I want you to note before Jesus sent us out, this is what he said. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is the ultimate authority, right? Uh, in heaven and on on earth. And people get healed every day. You don't hear about it on the news, right? Uh, it doesn't make the headlines in the newspapers. But listen, it happens in the hospitals each and every day. It happens when people go uh, to the cancer institutes, right? When they said, hey, um, this looks bad. We need to get you in. And they go and they call other believers and they cry out to God and they're praying and asking God if it is your will, touch me. And they go in uh, to get a plan together. They want to look at it. And guess what? It's gone. And doctors don't know what to say. They, they, they got one word for it. They call it miracles, right? And they happen each and every day. God is at work. He is active in this world. It has never stopped, right? Uh, God does the healing. Um, so we find this is one of those days that Jesus is healing people that are there. The crowd is here and they've gathered into this home. They are packed in and not only on the inside, but also on the exterior of the home. So here's what Luke says. He sets the scene. We all know what's going on now, right? Jesus is in the center of the home. Everybody's around, packed in and packed out. Here's what happens in verse number 18. He continues. He says, and behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the mist before Jesus. Let's stop right there. So we got the scene that's set, and all of a sudden Luke turns his attention right to why he's writing you and me. Right? Peter remembers this detail very lividly, and so he, he wants us to know what it, what, what's taking place. And uh, Luke tells us that, hey, there were some men. Uh, this uh, miracle is also, uh, this uh, miracle is in Mark, and Mark says the same thing. He says some men, right? Um, here's the thing. We don't know their names, but God does, Right? Uh, if you are a believer, a follower of Christ, you quickly understand we get the opportunity to do what God uh, allows us and wants us to do. And oftentimes, that's without a lot of fanfare, right? A lot of times, it's behind the scenes. But, and so here we find that these four men, right, we don't know their names, but we're going to learn what they did. And that's the most important thing, right? It's not their names that are important. It's not their names that God wants you to know about. It is what they did that he wants you and I to remember. And, and so these men, they heard the news. Hey, Jesus is here. He's in the area, right? And so um, they've got this friend. They've got this man that they know about. And they're like, you know, we've got to get him to Jesus. We've got to take him there. And we can do this if we pick 
each end and we carry them together, we can get him to Jesus. Uh, I would call these guys friends of faith, right? Uh, and, and we might say what they had here was a friend intervention. Um, it's pretty much like an intervention, right? They came and they said, you know what? We've got to do something. Now is the time. Let's get his. Let's get our friend. Let's take this man. Today is the day. Let's get him to Jesus. And so they intervened on his behalf. And I want you to connect for a moment with this man the Bible tells us about. It tells us that um, he's bedridden. Do you know anybody? Have you ever been around anyone um, who is bedridden, someone that is constrained uh, uh, by a bed, someone that's contained to a bed. You think about that. And now go back 2,000 years ago in your mind without the conveniences of modern medicine or, or, or technology. This is someone who can't provide for themselves. They can't travel. They don't have any of the, the freedoms or the luxuries that other people do. Their life's really reduced at this point. And this was this man, right? And, and so Luke is, is giving you and me some details. Luke is a physician by trade. And so he's providing like a case study here. He wants you to know, hey, um, there's a reason that he's bedridden. And he says this, this man was paralyzed. So think about what that means in this day and time, right? 2,000 years ago, it meant he, he's unable to walk. He's unable to bathe himself. He's unable to dress himself. He's unable to feed himself, to move. Someone is caring for him, right? He was unable to get out of the bed in which that he was lying on. And the man's family, uh, the man's friends, his caretakers, they knew there was nothing that could be done. This man's condition is hopeless. And that's it. There's no doctor. Luke's the physician. That's why I want you to know, hey, look, he was paralyzed. There was nothing that no doctor could do. No one could help this man. So he's letting you know this was his condition. But this man has some men in his life that recognized where he was at, that knew his condition. But more importantly than knowing what his condition was, they also knew that Jesus was in the community. They knew where Jesus was located. They knew what Jesus was capable of. They knew that, hey, doctors cannot help him, but we know a guy that can help him, but we've got to get him there. He's unable of getting himself there, but we can take him there. We can show him the way, right? We can get him there. These are friends of faith. Uh, the author Bob Goff said, a true friend doesn't just say things. A friend does. Here we find some men that had compassion, but it didn't end there. Their compassion moved them on behalf of their friend to get him to the Lord. And that's exactly what they did. They showed a care beyond just a friendship, right? They got a cot. They, and they literally, they carried him to the place where Jesus was. The man had no way of getting there by himself. So what did they do? They did some work and they got him to the place where Jesus was. That's what friendships of faith are. If you have a Christian friend, they're places of safety, places of love, places of care for one another, that, that deeply enough, right, that listen, you're willing to do the hard work when it's necessary. And, and this was hard work, right, carrying this guy. We don't know how the distance was or how long, but we know, hey, they carried him there to get him to Jesus. They cared for their friend. You know, in our day and time, we need to understand, like, caring for someone, it's not liking a post, <laughs> right? It's not seeing a comment and, and, or something that someone posts and, and liking it. It's, it's more deeper than that. These guys were moved to do something. They said, hey, this is our chance. This is our opportunity. There, there's a way to get him to Jesus and let's act on it. And it took some work, but they picked him up and they carried him to the house where Jesus was. And then, 
as the plan's going, right? Just like they had it in their mind. We're going to carry him. We'll get him to Jesus. And Jesus, we believe Jesus can do something. We believe Jesus will heal him. And that's why they're taking him. That's why they're going to the, the, this trouble. They want to do that because they believe in their heart of hearts that, hey, if we can get him to Jesus, Jesus can touch this man. He can change his life forever. And so they're going to do everything they can to get him to Jesus. And they make their way to the house. And here comes a problem. It's five to six people deep. Imagine this, all around the house. People are trying to get in. People are trying to listen. They have no way of getting in. They can't get to the house. They can't get to, the, to Jesus because the house is surrounded by a crowd of people. Did you get that? Did you see why they can't get in? It is because of the crowd. It's completely filled up. They want to get their hurting friend to Jesus. But guess what? People are in the way. People are in the way. And did you catch who also came from Jerusalem? The religious authorities. Did you catch that? Who is listening to Jesus? When we learn later, right, that this miracle is going to occur, who's sitting right there? Who hears the words that Jesus speaks to this man? It's the Pharisees. It's the religious people of the day. These guys can't get to Jesus because there's people that is standing in the way of them getting him to Jesus. A great lesson for us, right, to learn. They can't get him. They've got great intentions, they put in the effort. They put in the work. They have faith. They believe. But when they get there, they're just hit by this obstacle now. They cannot get their friend inside to get to Jesus. And you know what? I think there's a lot of us today that can relate to that. You got someone in your life, someone you care about, someone you love, and you want them so badly to get to Jesus. And you're willing to do whatever it would take to get on there. Let me tell you, if you have that person in your life, and if you're trying that, then you already know this, right? There will be obstacles in your way. I can guarantee you there will be obstacles in getting your friends to Jesus, your loved ones to Jesus. It's not an easy way, but it's worth it. They thought, you know what? Hey, here's what we'll do. We'll take him to Jesus. They come there, and then they realize, uh-oh. It's not going to be exactly what we thought. We've got some opposition. We've got some obstacles, right? Uh, maybe it's a person at work and, and you've grown to know and you know that they need the Lord, right? You know that they don't go to church. You know that the Lord's not in their life and you've been praying for them and you've been looking for the right time, the right thing to say, right to them, to have a conversation. And, and trust me, the day that you decide, that you hear the Lord and you're like, All right, yes, I'm gonna do that today, Lord. I'm gonna go in in the morning. I'm gonna right, right in their office, right in their keep. I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna invite them to church. I'm gonna tell them I care about them. But more importantly, God cares about them. And hey, I'm just going to pray that they would come to know the Lord. I'm going to give them a Bible. And listen, the day that you do that, you know what's going to happen? You're going to walk in. And don't be surprised if you walk in and you're fired up and you're ready and prayed up and you go in. Oh, they're out sick today. <laughs> what's that called? It's called obstacles. It's called opposition. Because listen, you've got an enemy of God and Satan and an entire legion, right, of, of fallen angels, they don't want anybody to come to Christ. And they're willing to stop at nothing to keep it from happening. So here, these guys got great intentions, and today is the day. Now is the time. Jesus is there. We are going to carry our friend and get them to Jesus. And praise God, when they get there, they can't get in. You know what, if nothing ever went wrong in life, we wouldn't need faith and we wouldn't need the trust in God though, right? Here they are and they've got a choice, okay? We're not getting in there. We can either turn and go back or we can be determined and we're gonna find a way and we're gonna have faith that God will see us through and we can get our friend to Jesus. 
You know, in the book of First Peter, chapter 5, verse 8, a lot of people uh, know this verse. Uh, it says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, we just talked about, right? He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Notice what he says next. Resist him and be firm in your faith. See, we have a choice, right? When we face opposition, when we face an adversary, we can resist, we can choose to do it, we can choose to stand firm in our faith, or we can turn. And this was the decision that these friends faced. It's a decision, I think, that we can relate to how these men felt, right? I bet everybody here, you've experienced setbacks, right? You've experienced delays at times in your life. You've you faced interruptions. You've had a plan and you've seen it through and you're on that plan and all of a sudden those plans get interrupted. How many of us have suffered disappointments? Do you think these guys, when they were, they were so happy, so excited, so eager to carry their friend, do you think that they were disappointed when they saw that they couldn't get in? Absolutely. I'm sure they were. It was a setback. And many of us in life, we've experienced those. We can relate to that, right? But you know what? With faith, setbacks can be turned into comebacks. And if you're here today and you've experienced a setback through faith in Christ, you can have a comeback. And these men were determined to get their friend to Jesus. And so they look around they say, God, help us. How are we going to get in this way? How are we going to get our friend to Jesus? And Luke tells us that there's an external staircase of the homes back during this time. And you could go up the staircase and get on the roof of the house. And so they see this and they decide, hey, there's a way. And they get their friend and they're carrying their friend on the cot up the stairs. How many of you have carried furniture up the stairs before, right? Man alive. You ever had to carry a mattress or, Lord forbid, ride a washer or dryer up, up the steps? You don't forget it. You remember it, right? I say that because this was no easy task. Listen, getting our friends, telling our loved ones and getting them to Jesus, it is not easy. It's not. You will face opposition. And when the Lord presents another way for you to get on there, it may not be easy. It may be difficult. It may seem hard. It was hard to get their friend up those steps. But they got him up there. I think today that if those four men were here, and maybe one day we'll see them and we'll get to meet them in heaven, they tell us this, when the devil blocks the door, go through the roof. Because that's the faith that they had. Is that the faith that you have today? I was telling Amanda yesterday that exact quote, and she goes, well, why not go through a window? Well, that's a good point. But that would be a little easier. They had to climb up. They had to work. They had to sweat. There's some heavy breathing. And then when they get up on the roof, Luke says they begin dismantling the roof. They take the tiles off, right? Now imagine this scene. Underneath you, all around the house, is crowds of people, right? The house is literally packed full. And all of a sudden, these men, they start, they've got enough faith. They're like, hey, we've made it this far. We're not stopping now. God's gave us another way. And they get up here, and now they've got to start tearing apart this roof. Now, I don't know, tiles, mud, whatever, right? The Bible doesn't say it's irrelevant. They were literally, though, dismantling it and tearing it apart. And just imagine, as you see the scene, right? Things start to fall down, some dust, some debris falling, right? People start complaining, looking up what's going on. You know, lights starting to break through. The owner of the home's calling his insurance agent. He's filing a claim already. All this is going on. And they tear a hole big enough to lower their friend and his cot through the roof and they get him down in front of Jesus because that's what they were willing to do in order to get their friend in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you willing to do to get your family, your friends, your loved ones in front of the Lord? 
Have you invited them to church? Sometimes it's like, hey, I've got someone in my life. I've been praying for them. Man, I hope they would come to Jesus. Have you even invited them to church? Maybe invite them to your small group. How about this? Have you bought them a Bible? Well, they're not a Christian. Why would they need? Well, that's why they need a Bible. Right? God, buy them a Bible. See how they respond. Trust me, this is enough, right? It's enough. What have we done? You say, well, I have invited them and they never come. And I, I get that. Listen, non-believers, people, they'll make excuses, right? Like, hey, where, I was looking for you Sunday. Oh, yeah, that's, I, I forgot. Hey, just eliminate that excuse. Say, I'll tell you what, why don't you come to church with me? I'll pick you up, right? And then after church, we can go and I'll, I'll buy you, I'll tell you how to eat. I'll buy you something to eat. What are we willing to do to make it really happen, to get people in front of Jesus? It is mine and your great privilege to bring people to the Lord, to get them in front of Him. And there'll always be an obstacle that we'll have to work around. The question is, are we going to be faithful enough? Are we going to be resilient enough to find a way to get them to Jesus? These four men were. And look what happens next in verse number 20. And when he saw their faith, very interesting right there. When he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees begin to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They've lowered their friend down. Everybody's watching. There's pure silence now in the room, in the house, right? People can't believe what they're witnessing. And all of a sudden, this man's laying there. And I love what the Bible says. Notice, right? Luke says this, who's getting it from Peter and from witnesses. He said that Jesus said when he saw their faith. Who is the their? His friends. Jesus was moved by the action and the care and the love and the faith of this man's friends. That they would go to so much effort, so much time, so much trial to be able to bring him and lay him and get him at the feet of Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he was moved in his heart. He was moved with compassion. And he would move heaven on their behalf. And you know what? We see this happen today. We see it happen throughout the Gospels. Someone comes and intervenes for someone else. And you know what? God moves on their behalf. Today we call this prayer. Maybe you have a friend or a loved one and you're praying for them. And God hears our prayers and he honors the prayers of his children. These men went to great lengths to get their friend before Jesus. Because they believe that, hey, he has the power. He has the authority. He's healed in the past. We've seen that he's healed others. We've heard the stories. We believe he can heal you as well. And they brought him to Jesus. Now many had seen people, or many had seen Jesus heal other people. But this time, Jesus does something different. Something that, hey, even his four friends did not expect. Jesus looks at the man who, who's paralyzed, and he says to him, Sir, your sins are forgiven. And for everybody in that room, and for us today, we see the true character of God. We see the heart of God. Because, right, we, we would hear this man, and just like Luke, this case study, hey, this man's paralyzed, this man's bedridden, this is horrible, what an what a awful condition, what I have to go through, and what I have to endure in life during this time. And yet Jesus sees that, but Jesus saw something more. And he, in his heart, he was moved. He turned to the man and he said, you know, your sins are forgiven you. Why did Jesus do that? Because this man's greatest need in his life was not of that being able to walk. It was his need for a Savior. It was his need to have his sins forgiven by Almighty God. And you know what? It's ours as well. 
the greatest need in every person's life that's here today. It's not financial stability. It's not a healthy body. It's a forgiven soul. A forgiven soul. And that is what Jesus speaks to here. Now, what's interesting, I don't know if you ever thought about this. Imagine what the people are hearing around, right? And imagine when Jesus looks at this man and he says, your sins are forgiven you. Could you imagine walking up to somebody and just looking at them and saying, hey, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. And they're like, well, who are you? What did I do to you, right? I'm not offended you. How can you say you forgive me? I'm not done anything to be forgiven of. And suddenly the Pharisees, they're asking the same question. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did he just say? Did he say he forgives this man of his sins? They're forgiven? Who is this guy? Because you can't forgive someone who hasn't offended you. The theologian C.S. Lewis said this about this story. He said, this makes sense only if he was really God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. He had sinned against God. He had sinned against Jesus. And Jesus in love and compassion and grace, he looks at him and he says, sir, your sins are forgiven. Jesus didn't say, hey, you're healed. Get up and go. No, he looked in the man's heart. He saw the inside. He saw his greatest need and he spoke to that need. And he said, sir, your sins are forgiven. Because a healthy body only assures life for a short period. But a forgiven soul lives forever. I thought as they sung that song, this went, worthy is the lamb. I pictured myself one day in heaven. We'll, uh, uh, well, I hope we're all there singing, worthy is the lamb, right? That'll be us in heaven one day. A forgiven soul lives forever. And so Jesus speaks to that and he forgives his sin. And all of a sudden, the religious authorities that are there, the Pharisees, they can't believe what they've just heard. And they're saying this amongst themselves. Some of them are thinking it, right? They're not even talking out loud. But Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking in their mind. He knows what they're saying among themselves. They're like, hey, this is blasphemous. This is like a term reserved, right? For those who really reviled God, rebelled against God. I mean, the lowest of lows. And they're like, hey, this is blasphemy. You can't say this. I mean, think about this. This man's sin was just forgiven. That's a great day. A great day. And the very first thing that happens is he gets criticized. He gets critiqued. Let us be slow to criticize and critique and be quick to celebrate what God is doing in people's lives, right? Have you ever heard somebody and they've come to the Lord or you hear about, hey, uh, such and such got saved. They, they came to the Lord and somebody's like, well, I got to see that to believe it. Uh, you know, <laughs> or give them three weeks. What? That's what the Pharisees just said. I know, well, wait a minute. No, no, no. You can't do that. Take that back. You can't say that. We got to be quick to celebrate when God's at work and what he does in people's lives. So they make this statement. Like, you can't do that. You can't say that. Look how Jesus responds in verse number 22. And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, and that's important, right? Again, it's in their minds. They're not speaking out loud. Jesus is hearing what they're thinking, what they're saying. He knows what we think and what we say. He answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Well, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they all glorified God 
and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Jesus perceives their thoughts. He said, hey, what is easier for me to do or for me to say? And let's think about this for a minute, what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, It's much easier for a fraud to say, hey, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because we can't prove that their sins are forgiven or not, right? And that's what Jesus said. It is much more difficult for a fraud to say to someone who's paralyzed, you're healed, stand up and walk. Because if they don't, you're exposed as a fraud, right? And so Jesus puts this in front of them. And what's amazing is that before, you know, uh, the room full of theologians can answer him, Jesus speaks up and he says, but so that you guys know, that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin, rise up and walk. He wants them to know, I've got authority over both. I've got authority over the body, but more importantly, I have authority over the soul as well. He has it all. He is above all. It's the first time in Luke's gospel that Jesus uses the title Son of Man. He uses it 25 times in the Gospel of Luke alone. It reminds us when Jesus says it, Jesus is saying, hey, I identify with you. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to hurt. I know what it's like to suffer. He looked at them and he's like, I know what it's like to experience setbacks. I know what it's like to face interruptions. I know what it's like, right, to, to, to be going down one path and think, hey, this is the way, and to face an obstacle. I know what it's like to face the opposition. He come to me too, and he comes to me daily. But you have overcome. The Son of Man, he says, I came to accomplish a mission on your behalf. I have a d- divine authority I am God, but yet I know how you feel. And you're the reason that I'm here. Therefore, I can forgive sin. And guys, that's a good day. And that is a great thing. And here's why. Because you will not find another religion on this world that will forgive you of your sin. Did you know that? Every other religion is about you obeying someone's list of rules so that you can make God love you. That is not what Jesus did. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus loves you unconditionally by grace, and he just forgives the man. He didn't tell this man to do anything. He didn't tell him, hey, I need you to start doing this, I need you to stop doing that. It, n- n- none. He looked at this man, he forgave him of his sin, just as he was and who he was. He says, you are forgiven. And Jesus changed him right there on the spot, from the inside out. Because that's what Christianity is. It is an inside job. Jesus looks at him and he said, but so that you will know that I have authority to forgive people's sin. He turned to this man and he said, sir, Rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately, before everybody that was in the house, this man picks up his bed that he had been lying on, that he was bedridden on, and he went home glorifying God. Can you imagine what was going on in his heart and in his mind? I was carried here on a stretcher met Jesus, and now I'm carrying my stretcher home. That's a good day. That's a great day, right? Listen, many of us, we've experienced that. We've come in before, and we've come in heavy-hearted, burdened, weighed down. And we've heard the Lord, and through song, through word, we come through prayer, and we leave much better than we left, right? We cast it off. We give it to the Savior. He carries the load. He gives us rest. We've experienced what this man experienced. He says that everybody in the room, right, was suddenly in awe. This means 
truthfully. It means indeed. It means to express astonishment. The awe of God, right, that set a hold on every one of the people that were in this house. It meant all of a sudden they realized, you know what? There's a greater story that is much more important than my own personal story. And these people were astonished. And they praised God and they glorified him. Someone once said this, whether we know it or not, the awe of every human being, the desire to be amazed, blown away, to be moved, and to be satisfied is actually a universal craving to see God face to face. And that day, everybody in that room, everybody in that house, they saw the face and the heart of God and they were blown away in amazement. What about you today? Is the awe of God alive in your heart and in your life? When you look around and you know that friend, that loved one you, you care about, that they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what are we willing to do to help initiate that? What are we willing to do to, to get them in front of Jesus what are we willing to do to, to get them to come into church so they could hear the word of God, so that they could hear songs, so they could be around other Christian men and women? What are we will, really willing to do? Are we making ourselves available to the Lord to be used? Let's be faithful friends and let's remember that there's always a way. We just have to ask God to allow us to be a part of it. Let us be a small part in it. Let us pray this morning. Jesus, we thank you so much for just this incredible gospel story that Mark and Luke capture, Lord. We thank you for these men, Lord, in the faith that they, Lord, showed us today and that we can learn from that they cared enough for their friend that not just to pray for him, but to put their faith in the action. To put it in the deed. Lord, help us today as we have people on our heart and we say, Lord, give me the strength. I'm going to do this today. And when we're met with obstacles and we get discouraged and we get disappointed, Help us, as Peter said, to be determined. Help us to resist the enemy. Help us to stand firm in our faith. To reach out to love, to care. Or lay that person on our heart that we can make a difference. Maybe there's somebody we've been walking by every day and we have yet to realize that they're hurting. That they're lonely. That they don't know you that their sins have not been forgiven. Lord, show us and let us have compassion, a compassion that moves us, that we might bring them near to you. Jesus, we thank you for forgiving our sin. You're the only person that can do it. There is no other name in heaven and on earth other than the name of Jesus that can forgive us of our sin. And so, Lord, today... I pray that you would speak to hearts first and foremost. There's somebody here, they don't have a relationship with you. Today is today, Lord. They came in carrying a heavy burden, a life full of sin, a heart, Lord, that is just raging inside. And Lord, we pray that today they would come and give their heart and their life to you, that you would give them peace and joy and rest, and they could leave here different, Lord, than when they came. And Lord, inspire your children this morning, your sons and your daughters, Lord, to go out and reach a lost and dying world and to bring them in before you. Lord, even if it takes tearing the roof off, let us be hungry to get them to you before it's too late. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, why don't we stand? If you need to pray, come and pray. If you got somebody laid on your heart, come and pray. We'll help you pray with, with you and for them. Just be obedient to the Lord. Let's worship together this morning.
righteousness and the blood you shed for us so that we could be with you, God, that we could know you, that we could have a relationship with you, and that we could be with you forever. God, thank you for this church family. Thank you for the friends in our lives who are willing to move on our behalf, not just in prayer, God, but in their deeds as well. Just thank you for them. Help us to be that friend to others this week, God. Thank you for being that 